We look at our country and polling shows that more than three-fourths of the nation thinks that we're headed in the wrong direction. The approval numbers for all three branches of government have plummeted. We need to see some significant changes. I think we're probably all familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is the well-known passage in which God promises that if we, who are called by His name, will humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, that He will hear from heaven and heal our land. Certainly, America's health and healing starts with prayer. Earlier generations definitely understood this. In fact, by 1815, there had been over 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. In fact, John Hancock himself personally issued 22 prayer proclamations such as this one. But John Hancock understood that prayer by itself wasn't enough, that we couldn't just stop with prayer. As he admonished citizens in his day, I urge you, by all that is dear, by all that is honorable, by all that is sacred, not only that you pray, but that you act. We must seek God and appeal to Him for help, but then we must also do everything we can to make a difference. Remember 2 Chronicles 7.14? We're to pray, but it also says that we're to turn from our wicked ways, and that includes our inactivity and non-involvement, our sitting on the sidelines, particularly with regard to what goes on in our government. This is part of the wicked ways from which American Christians in particular must turn. We have to pray and rely on God, but we also have to take action. This is what made America free in the first place. When the American Revolution began, we had no major assets of our own. We'd been British colonies our entire existence, and now we're going to take on the greatest military power in the world with only our fledgling resources? Britain had a formidable navy. They ruled the seas. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, we could build our own navy, but in the early years, we didn't even have a national government, and so there's no way to fund a navy. But fortunately, in 1775, still almost a year before the Declaration of Independence, George Washington stepped up as an individual and personally commissioned six cruisers. Of course, those six ships from George Washington weren't much compared to the scores of ships in Britain's Navy, but that's what we had. And back then, all the ships in a nation's navy flew their flag openly and visibly so that their fellow ships could avoid the friendly fire and not sink the wrong ships. So the British had their flag, but not the Americans. We're brand new. We don't even have a national flag yet. So how are we going to recognize our fellow ships? No problem. We'll create our first flag. And according to official records, it was a flag with a white background, a pine tree in the middle, and it included the motto, Appeal to Heaven. This was our first flag, and it flew on our Navy. A year later, after the Declaration was signed, the state of Massachusetts built its own state Navy, and this was also adopted as the official flag for their Navy. And then the Massachusetts Army adopted a flag for its ground forces, and it had a similar motto, an appeal to God. As these official mottos and declarations and flags indicate, we openly relied on God, but we didn't stop there. That was just the first step. As John Hancock had urged, we prayed and we acted. This same combination of prayer and action remained a no-brainer for American Christians for generations afterwards. In fact, a century and a half after the Revolution, Teddy Roosevelt penned this book, Fear God and Take Your Own Part. As Teddy explained, but in addition to fearing God, it is necessary that we should be able and ready to take our own part. The man who cannot take his own part is a nuisance in the community, a source of weakness, an encouragement to wrongdoers, and an added burden to the men who wish to do what is right. If he cannot take his own part, then somebody else has to take it for him. There is no reason that God-fearing Christians should be a burden to anyone else, especially to the nation in general. We need to step up and carry our weight. As God-fearing people, we have a voice, and we also have overwhelming numbers. But if we continue to remain silent and uninvolved, we'll have no one to blame for the godless outcome but ourselves. We need to recruit good people to run for office or even run for office ourselves. We need to speak out about what's going on around us, but we absolutely, definitely, unequivocally must vote. That's not optional. Voting is not a right, it's a duty. And we will answer to God for what we do or what we don't do with our vote. So we do have to appeal to God but we also have to take action, and now is the time that we must get involved.